my life verse. A verse that I hold near and dear to my heart because of what I'm doing and what God has called me to do. If you could take your Bible with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. And Brother Roster said that you guys usually get out of here at 7 o'clock, is that right? No, I'm joking. it's not 7 o'clock. So I, I'm going to be very, very quick and, uh, because I want to uh, get, this, uh, get you not just out of here, but I want to give you opportunity to respond to what the Lord and what you have seen tonight. <clears throat> My wife and I, our mission with it being two-pronged is, is, is really our burden. FCA established a platform called Grab Your Cleats, and really, I should not be in Hernando County right now. I should literally still be in Tampa, just continue to work with my group. But I know this, is that there are 56 million students in America. That's the size of South Africa. That may not have the gospel in their school. You say, well, someone will reach them outside of their school. The truth is, if you go inside the school, you'll find now that there are parents that do not know God and don't want their children to know who God is. Because of the way the world is, they most likely, it is an unreached people group. And to take the Bible in there is a huge opportunity for the church. So I have literally, for me and my wife, our burden is to, I don't care where you're at, if you want to start, if you want to reach your schools, let me help you. Let me engage the church. Let me equip the church. Let me empower the church. If I can speak your language, let's get together and let's make it work for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I've been able, we've been able to help people in North Carolina, Ohio, now Hernando County, which we're super pumped about being able to see this happen, especially Thursday, a great opportunity. I'll be up here again. So this is not just, hey, this is what we're doing in South Tampa. You know, we hope you pray for us. It is now, if I could flip the switch to, hey, what are we going to do in Hernando County? How are we going to reach the 22,000 students that are right here? You say, you truly believe we can reach 22,000? I know this is that God's commanded us to at least go try. At least give them the gospel. At least, at least see the door of opportunity and go through it. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3 and uh, in verse, uh, let me see here. Let's start um, verse number 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens are of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water. Basically, verses before, he talks about how the world was wicked, and it was destroyed, and now it's wicked again. And because of that wickedness, God's going to come back soon. And uh, he says, now it stands out of the water, you know, it was flooded. It's no longer that way. Whereby, verse 6, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Peter is saying here that the world was perished once with water. And it's getting to a place again where God is going to destroy it again with fire unto that day of judgment. And I don't, I don't know about you, it's really interesting. You know, I'm, I'm a Baptist by conviction and it's like, even so, Lord, come quickly, right? Like, hey, let's, uh, my kids are growing up, and I'm like, oh, man, what's the world going to be like when they get older? Like, the things they hear and see, the things that you may, you try to protect them from. Cartoons are not cartoons anymore. And they, it's just all these, and I'm thinking, even so, Lord, come quickly. And that was their mentality and their attitude right here. Even so, Lord, come quickly. Hey, bring on the fire. We're ready. We're right with Jesus. You know, they deserve that judgment, all right? So verse number seven, but the heaven, sorry, verse uh, number eight. But lo beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, the day of judgment. This is what he's referencing to, the day of. They're thinking, oh, well, you know, that day. A thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And then verse number nine. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Verse number nine. The Lord is not slack. The Lord is not slack. 
The word slack there literally means to delay, to tarry. I don't know about you, but tonight I am so grateful that God is not slack concerning his promise. Raise your hand if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Hey, that is because he has not been slack. He's been working and maneuvering in your life so that you could have that opportunity to receive him as your personal Savior. I don't know about you. God's not been slack, but there are a couple of times that just a couple. Don't ask my wife. She'll tell you more. But me, it's a couple. There's only been a few times that I've been slack. I'm not going to ask you if you raise your hand if you've ever been slack, but you know I'm talking about husbands, right? Say, hey, your, your wife says, hey, go get this and go get that. And, okay, I, did you bring the list? No, no, I got it, I got it, I got it. And then you come back, right? You come back and it's like, hey, did you get the, uh, I didn't. You know, I mean, you, you're a little slack there, a little forgetful. Or maybe you're out and your wife told you something two months before and she expected you to remember it that two months before in passing and to read your mind at that time that, you know, read her mind that time that you were supposed to get that and you come home and, hey, why didn't you get that? Because I'm not a mind reader, I know. I didn't think you needed that right now. You were slack. You didn't know those things. You didn't have the power of control that was there. Wives, you know what I'm talking about. You know, busy life, you have children. I'm not going to say who I know have, has done this. You know, you've probably done this yourself. But drive to the store and then realize one, two, three, one, two, three, one's missing. You know, let's load the car back up and go. My wife hasn't done that. I don't think you have. Have you done that? I, no, I didn't think so. I think I've done that. And so, but, uh, you know, drive back. You know, that's slack. Forgetful, Terry. But God hasn't been slack. You know why he hasn't been slack? Because he is all-knowing and all-powerful. He is in control, and his desire is that everyone would come to know him as their personal Savior. God, from the beginning of time, has been working diligently and vigorously, intentionally concerning this promise, not willing that any should perish. And that even means the kids that grow up in a home that are totally twisted. That even means the young man that, that, that when he walks into school, he wears the dress and the lipstick and the confusion that is it. That means them too, right where they're at, right inside their schools. I'll be honest, when the Bible is taken out of school, there becomes this mentality of, you know, you reap what you sow. Good riddance, right? You, you're getting what you deserve. But God, that's not how God feels. God says, hey, no, no, no. I need to see them saved. I'm going to do whatever it takes to be able to, for them to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, to have an opportunity to receive my son. So why has God not been slack? Look with me in that verse. First, we see his purpose. The Bible says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, not willing that any should perish. Not willing that any should perish, and that is why he hasn't been slack. The the scripture shows us this. In Luke 15, it talks about these three stories Jesus talks about. He talks about the 99 and the one. He talks about the 99 sheep that he has, but he loses the one, and he'll forsake and leave the 99 to go find that one sheep. And all three of these talk about Jesus working, God working to reach the lost. God is busy. Although his sanctification is working in our life, he is the one that is busy about justification. He is the one that is diligently working because he's not slack at all concerning this promise. And he'll he'll leave the 99 to come and find that one. I think of Jesus when he's doing the work of the Father and he looks at the disciples and says, I must needs go through Samaria. Hey, there was one right there, a wicked lady, the woman at the well as we sang about her, that one. Then it talks about the coins and the lady that had the ten coins and and she loses one. Coins of value. She had nine. Come on, lady. You have nine. Are you got to be that greedy? No, no. What they're showing us is this, is that one soul is so valuable to God. So valuable. Oh, he has the nine and... They are, they have a value of great worth, but all oh, that one coin. He'll, she turns the entire house upside down to find the one coin. And that's what God would do too. And that's what God is doing. Turning things upside down. Turning things like, God, I didn't think you could use them. I didn't think you could do that. Why would you bring that up through the generations and allow uh, that group to be used by you? Oh, because he's not slack concerning his promise. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And then the last one is... The prodigal son, he goes away and he leaves. 
And I always thought of it in the sense of the, the, the loss or, or the prodigal son being saved. But in the context of Scripture, he, it's all talking about reaching a lost person, about how comparing God to these stories, the woman, the shepherd, the father. And the thing that I never realized in the story of the prodigal son is this, is that which is not seen, the son that goes away. And God does whatever it takes to reach him. Takes him of his wealth, his health, and then he reminds him of where the truth lies. And he goes to the Father. God has not been slain because of his purpose, not willing that any should perish. And the Bible says this, that all the heavens rejoice. Over 100,000 souls to get saved. No, just one. Just one. And if God in the heavens get excited of so many things to rejoice over, you know, I think of this about when God created man or God created the heavens and the earth and how the angels, whoa, God, you are so, and they could rejoice. The one thing the Bible says that they rejoice over is a soul to receive Jesus Christ. If they get excited about it, we ought to get excited about it. And God's not been slack. I want to mention a couple names, and I don't know how they'll resonate with you, but I know how they resonate with me. But a name like Adolf Hitler, right? Mm, someone said, mm, right? A very persuasive man, a very wicked man. The, the Holocaust and the horror that was through there. Something more relevant and probably strikes home, especially with military being here. I think of 9-11, right? I think of those that carried out those deeds, Think about Osama bin Laden. I think about anyone that may have taken an action against your family that may have taken a life. For us, I don't know about you, but Adolf Hitler, we got him, right? Yes, sir. America's great. Osama bin Laden, we got him, right? Let's go get him, boys. But to God, his heart broke because he's not willing that any should perish. Oh, God is judge. But oh, but he is merciful and he shows such grace because we are no different than those men. And he did all. You say, how do you know that God did all that was in his power? Because he's not slack concerning his promise, not willing that any should perish. God doesn't want one person to go to hell. It wasn't created for them. It was created for the devil and his angels. And oh, but when these men broke hell wide open, his heart was grieved. And just as a student, literally, just the... It hasn't even been a full school year that I've been working with all these different schools. But in this one football team that I've been working with, just this one football team, we've experienced five deaths. One was a student. The other was a, a student's father. The, the other three were grandparents. Life is so quick and is but a vapor. And if you get out there, you realize how broke people are. There's one young man, his father's in jail and knows he'll never see his dad again. Life is so short, but God doesn't desire for them to perish, but he desires to, for them to come to know him. First, we see his purpose and why he's not slack concerning his promise. Because God loves us and loves the entire world. God loves each and every person that enters into this world so much that he's bound himself by this promise in, this, in his word that he would not be slack concerning this, pro, uh, this promise. But that all should come to repentance. Because he hasn't been slack in his plan, he made a, sorry, because he hasn't been slack in his purpose, he made a plan. And the plan is great, it's very simple, and you know it. Is that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to come and to die for me and for you. He, he, he had a plan before the earth was ever created. The Bible says before the foundation of the world, 1 Peter 1, 19 through 20, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these things. He was sent, the Savior was before the foundation of the world. He is now our propitiation, as the Bible says in 1 John 2, 2. But not only was his plan to send his son to save the world, but his plan was to commission the church. And when I think of the Great Commission, I, if I could be honest with you, even though my heart has been to reach public school kids, I've never seen, or to get the gospel into the public schools, I've never really had a thought that the public school is a mission field. But the Bible talks about the commission, Acts 1-8, but, but ye shall receive power. 
After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Can you be honest with me tonight? When I say missions, does your mind go to the uttermost parts of the earth? Can you raise your hand tonight? I'm just curious. Just a few. Good, yeah. My, I, I put both hands. My mind immediately goes to Africa, to Djibouti, Zimbabwe. Uh, you know, all, that's where it goes. But we fail to remember. It doesn't even go beyond Samaria. I think of that. You know, people that are outcasts, people that uh, are broken and hurt. You know, being a Judea, the you know, church planning, you know, that kind of idea, Judea. But Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Nature Coast, is that right? That's right, right down the road here? Jerusalem. And that God had a plan. His plan was to send a Savior and then to commission the church. And I stand before you tonight, even myself, and realize that we forgot our Jerusalem. We've been door knocking, and that's great. I think that's wonderful. But there's opportunities in which have arisen for us to take and share the gospel even further in our Jerusalem. He said, how do you know this? Remember the youth pastors and the pastors that I got to meet when I was in college? And their minds were blown that we could have the gospel and the Bible taught inside a public school. If the leadership doesn't know that it's an opportunity, how can I expect the people? How can we expect the people to see the opportunity? You can't. So God made a plan. He commissioned the church. He sent his Savior. And I think it is when God commissioned the church, he commissioned everyone that knows Jesus Christ as their personal Savior that's willing to share what God has done in their life. Brother Scott Paul, you all going to hear him. Those that are going to go off was telling, uh, he actually made a post on his Facebook page about two months ago. He travels all over the world now sharing the gospel and evangelism. And the post was this. He said, uh, he says, it's never fun when your flight is canceled or delayed or, of course, I'm doing the Charlie version of his post, and, and changed. And, uh, and I thought in my mind, never fly Spirit, never fly Legion. You'll be doing great. <laughs> and so those that have flown with them, you know what I'm talking about. And so, but we still fly Spirit and Legion because it's the cheapest out there. And so um, he said, you know, that, that's never fun when that happens. He said, but my plane got changed, and everything got changed up, and God put me right next to a young lady. I got the chance to share the gospel with her, and she accepted Christ. You know why his plans got changed? Say it again. Why his plan got changed? Because he's not slack. That's why his plans got changed. And if you're willing to share the gospel, how many of you have ever had your, chan your, your plans change? You know, going on vacation, and you're driving, brand new tires. You know what I'm talking about, right? And then, boom, 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 boom. Like, what in the world are you doing? Like, what? We're, we're going on vacation. There's no vacation. Some guy comes up. He comes and helps you change the tire out. And in your back of your mind, you're thinking, you know, I just, I'll just i give him a track. And you're, hey, hey, you know, I just want to, I'd love to invite you out to our church. You know what? I've been searching. And poof, God blows that door open. You know why your plans need to be changed? Because he's not slack. Amen. He'll do whatever it takes. Hey, if Jesus had to go out of his way to go to a city that they shouldn't be going to in Samaria to see a girl that's a Gentile, and Jesus didn't come to the Gentiles at the time. He came to the Jews, but she would receive him, and he inconvenienced his life and all the disciples' lives to see her accept him. Why does God change our plans? Because he is not slack concerning his promise. Have you, have you ever been there where you've been sharing the gospel with somebody and you're thinking, I have butchered the gospel? They have, this person has no idea not only to receive Jesus and go to heaven, but they don't even know how to get out of here. I've messed it up so bad, all right? But they accepted Christ that day. How many of you know how that, you've had that happen, right? Yep. That's because God's not slack concerning his promise because it's not in your power. It's in his power, as Paul says. And so it's so important that we realize this, that it is not because of us. God has commissioned us just to share. Some people ask the question, so well, then why do people perish? I truly believe this is why people perish, because of free will, obviously. But it's not because God wants people to perish, because they choose, they don't choose God's plan. They choose their plan. And we have an opportunity to, you have an opportunity, because I won't be up here in Hernando. I have an opportunity in my hometown, and you have an opportunity right here to walk inside your school and to say, hey, there are two ways in life. There's God's plan and there's your plan. Which one are you going to choose? 
You know, I've never heard of this God's plan before. And you say, there's no way that's true. That is very true. I'm even talking about the kid that goes to church every week, but has never heard the gospel. He knows what it means to be a Christian, what it looks like to be a Christian, but no, no one's ever told him they had to personally receive him as his personal savior. I watched six kids in a lunch Bible study bow their head and accept Christ. Why? Because they had never heard that they had to personally accept him themselves. Go to church on a weekly basis. God's not slack concerning his promise. And God's been working and he has a, a purpose and he has a plan, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God wants to see your school reached for his cause. And my third point is this, is the players of his plan. The players on his, uh, 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 in his plan, the players have to be on his team. If you're here tonight and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you're not on his team. His team, is on the win his team is the winning team. But if you have received him and put your faith and trust in Christ in him, you're on the winning side. Hey, if the clock struck zero, we win. And that's awesome. And that's exciting. But there's a lot of people that lose. And then God needs his team to step up to the plate. See, the, I've noticed for myself, too, is that there are a lot of people on the team, tons on the team, but not many in the game. I mean, thousands are on his team. The, the heavens will be filled with those that know him, but not many in the game. So how do you know this? Because the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And in God's plan, if you know Christ, you're on his team. And it doesn't mean you're a Baptist. It doesn't mean you're a churchgoer. It, means that, it doesn't mean that you have to have the, the gospel present, presentation down pat. You're like, Brother Charles, you tell me that I'll be able to go inside of school. I don't even know how to lead someone outside of school to Jesus Christ, yet alone inside of school. How would I be able to do that? Well, God's not slack. He just needs someone that's on his team to, to say, hey, I'm tired of riding the pine. These, these uh, what are they called with wood? Splinters. Thank you. I couldn't think of it. These splinters are hurting too much. I'm ready to get in the game. I'm ready. And FCA, we've actually launched a model called Grab Your Cleats. I'm ready to grab my cleats, and it's about time to play. It's about time that we get active. And you say, well, you know what? This school thing isn't my thing. That's completely okay. What is your thing? For some of you, the school thing is your thing. For some of you, the sports thing is your thing. For some of you, you're a coach here, and you know, that's your thing. And, and you have influence. But hey, let's not just teach them X's and O's. But let's teach them about Jesus. Let's teach them about what life truly is all about. We grab them cleats and get in the game and play. And get in the game and see what God does in our life as he uses us. His players, those that are on his team, those that are willing to get into the game. And God will use anyone that is willing to share his promise. God hasn't been slack. But can I challenge you tonight? Don't be slack. Don't be slack. I think of 205 schools, 250,000 students. To be honest with you, it's undaunting in my mind. As I looked up how many schools that were with yours, I was like, sign me up. I got all those. You know, I, mean? I was like, let's go at it, all right? But I have my mission field. I don't live in Hernando County. You have yours. You say, Charlie, you're employed. You know, I, you know actually, you know what I'm employed to do? That's what I'm employed to do. And it's, it's, a, it's a larger responsibility. I'm employed to get into these schools and to find a church, to actively engage that church, and to turn that church into that school, and to help train their laborers to go inside that school. And to still do the same thing as ministering to schools and then to leave and to develop more ministry inside new schools. In one school, there's over seven Bible clubs that we have in one school. I can't do all that. But it's a two-pronged thing. It's a ministry. But you say, you know what? I know what I can do. I can give a morning. Just one morning, 45 minutes, one more. I can do that. Before I go to work, I'll go off that middle school and I'll love on those kids and I'll share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hey, it's easy getting again. Maybe, maybe, you know, I love sports, and I, would, I want to use it in some way. How many of you would agree that sports has become a god? Raise your hand in America. Every hand. 
If I brought Tim Tebow in here right now, actually, you saw Dabo Sweeney. If I brought Dabo in here, okay, Dabo Sweeney, you know how he came to know Christ? He was a coach, and FCA went to him and shared the gospel, and he accepted Christ. His words were, I didn't go to a church. I think that's good, but FCA is a go ministry. And it's a vehicle in which you as an individual can connect to, not because, just because we do want to see kids saved, but we want to see these kids discipled and see God working in their life. And I'm here to tell you tonight, God's not been slack. And I'm here to tell you tonight, not because I'm employed by FCA. Brother Rossiter mentioned I've been with FCA for multiple years, but the truth is, Brother Rossiter, this is the first time I've been with FCA. And it's not, I think there's just communication error. It wasn't he was lying or anything, or I lied to him. But I was connected to another ministry club that was inside a school, but the goal was just to go in there once to check off the box. Hey, we got a gospel presence in there. That's not FCA's concern. FCA's concern, as you saw the mission of the vision, is to lead every coach and every athlete into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. You're like, what about the other students? That's where we take their influence as a coach and their influence as an athlete to reach the other students. Dabo Sweeney, Sweeney walk in here. This room would be packed out because of one man's influence as a football coach and have an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what FCA is. And I truly believe is the best tool. And if I could tell you tonight, Paired with this message, it is the tool in which God is using to reach your public schools. I want to put together some history, and hopefully you can see what God did in my mind as I saw it. 1956, FCA would, began with Don McLannan. Don McLannan was a basketball coach and wanted to be able to use this opportunity of sports. Reached out to a man by the name of Branch Rickey. Branch Rickey was the first gentleman to sign Jackie Robertson. So a kind of a guy that kind of pays his own way. Eight years later, the Bible would be taken out of the public school system. God knew this. And as generations would go past and go down, there'd be a fight, an attack on the word of God still remaining inside a public school. FCA is there, but in 1986, Ronald Reagan passed a law called the Equal Access Law. And every point of that law has been tried to the Supreme Court to the, uh, to the umph degree, if I could say that right way, and passed that it is okay to have a club, student-led, teacher-sponsored, inside of a school. And it doesn't matter what type of club it is, it's a club. And that has paved the way and the opportunity, God has used that, to continue to keep the Bible in where it is today in the public school. As I mentioned, 63... Years went by, FCA had the same model. Just last year, FCA changed their entire model. I would not be standing before you today if they did not change their model to say, engage the church. Tell the church about this great need. And as they said in training, FCA wants to let you use us as an umbrella. We want to tee it up for you to just walk in there and under the umbrella of FCA to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, Charlie, how do you know that this is true? Because God's not slack. He foresaw saw it all. He foresaw that the students that are inside the schools now would most likely, the majority of them, wouldn't walk through these doors, would never hear the gospel because of the family that they grew up in. And God made a way for us to actively engage them inside their schools and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm excited about what God is doing. And I want to challenge you tonight to not just say, hey, you know, this is great. I, I know I appreciate Brother Ross and I appreciate the church letting us come in. Our goal was to share what our burden is, for you to pray for us. If you'd like to take us on for support, that'd be great. We would love that. It would help us do more ministry because we need that, that's for sure. But our heart goal is to see a church actively involved, not just in their community because you're doing that. You're a great church, but to be involved in the school. And so when you walked in, hopefully you, everyone got one. If you didn't, our, our children passed something out to you. And I want you to pull that out right now. It looks just like this if you got it. Because I think it's so important that when you hear a message, you, you make a decision if the Lord is speaking to your heart. Maybe if you didn't, maybe, the, maybe tonight you were here and you, know, you didn't make a decision. The truth is you did make a decision. Whether to listen or not and allow the Lord to speak to you or not. But I want you to flip that over and there are three ways in which you can get actively involved already in your schools. The first thing is that you can pray. 
You can pray for your school. Pray for the teachers that are there. You can pray for the students that you have right here inside your school. In Hillsborough County, they say st students have all power. I don't know how it is in Hernando County. I have a feeling it's a whole lot looser, all right? And so, where the students have the same, have power to be able to share their testimonies. You can pray. You can go. You say, you know what? God's spoken to me, and I do. I want to get involved. I, I'm, sign me up. I want to minister to a coach. I want to minister to a team. We'll train you and help you with that process. Don't, don't, we're not going to just let you disappear and get worried about how you're going to do that and things. So, you know, I want to go. That's, that's me. I want to go. They say, you know what I want to do? I want to give. And this is what I want to do. I want to challenge you. Any money that is raised tonight, we want to be able to, you say, no, I signed up to give. You can give a one-time gift or a monthly gift. We want to be able to take those funds and to set them aside to send kids that are lost. Kids that we have influence with through sports to camp. So they can hear an opportunity again, an isolated opportunity, camp, controlled atmosphere for the ministry of preaching. Trust me, FCA camp, they hear preaching twice every day, and then they have Bible study, and then they have breakout sessions. They literally, they, they go there only to play sport. They go there to play sports, and they only play one hour of sports. So I don't know if we're lying to them, but that's their mentality. We're just not telling them that's not why you're coming. And so they'll go and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I want to challenge you tonight to grab your cleats and to get involved in some way. And I can't say it good enough, but we have a video I want to show you real quick. It's the first FCA by Branch Rickey preaching a message. I want you to hear what he has to say, and then I'll come and finish. I don't know why you're here, but there is a reason for this fellowship of Christian athletes, I think. The most damnable thing I know of in the life of youth today is idleness. There's a great danger there. Athletics has a place. Why this thing of fellowship of Christian athletes seems to have arisen in the mind of a few men. This fellowship. You're not going to get a thing out of it. Not one of you. There's a service in this field. There's a responsibility in this field. The potential is almost beyond conception. Thank you. The Would you do it? If he called you to do something, would you do it? April 1st, God called me to step out. Four babies to feed and a wife. We did. Because he wanted to see 40 souls that didn't know him receive him already this year. 5,000 students impacted with the gospel, with the Bible, right where they were. You can do the same. A challenge. You say, what is the challenge of the message tonight? The message is this. God's not slack. Sometimes we are. And Jesus is coming soon. Amen. And the trumpet's going to sound and the song goes, you know, hey, we're excited. We're going to shout. But there are going to be many that are going to split hell wide open. And God says, that's not what I want. I'm here to challenge and to tell you tonight, there is an opportunity to reach your schools. And if I could say a message, I appreciate your pastor and his wife and their heart. This church, the heart comes right. I mean, 42, sign up for cookies. You asked for 22. I'm like, man, stop. No, but no, keep. You know why? Because you want to impact your community. It's another opportunity. But it's, it's going to take some laborers. I'll leave you with this. 
I was driving in West Virginia shortly after we resigned at Southside Baptist Church. And I drove past in West Virginia, I drove past a, like a wheat field or a straw field, and it was wide into harvest, which I thought was really cool. You know, the Bible talks about that. And I remember driving, and I said, look, Dad. And I was uh, talking to my wife's dad, and I uh, called him down. I said, look, Dad. I was like, you know, the harvest truly is plenteous. And it was. It was just a field. If you've ever been to West Virginia, they have plenty of those fields. <laughs> you know, just blowing in the wind. Beautiful. He said, Charlie, you know what's interesting? Which I never knew this, but Jesus did when he mentioned this. He said, the interesting thing about that is, is that you only have two weeks to reap the harvest. And then it begins to die. Jesus is coming soon. Say, so, hey, I'll get in on the next inning. You know, when no one else is there, I, that's when I'll do it. The harvest may be gone. And when Jesus said, hey, the harvest is plenteous, but the labors are few. The woman at the well, you don't have to be righteous. You, you don't have to get all your everything right. She just went to the city and said, hey, let me tell you about a man that told me told me everything that I was. People came out and received him because of his power. Every head bowed, every eye closed, and I appreciate you.